Many of you, many families, students, teachers, and administrators across the country have already started the 2021 school year, or, of course, it won't be very long until the school bells ring for many of you. As part of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, K-12 through schools and those in higher education have been discussing and planning on how the upcoming school year will look. We know there are a variety of models either in place or are going to be put in place. We're talking about, of course, in-person, online, hybrid, maybe a split type model. In this episode, a trio of experts in education are going to share their invaluable insights, and we thought it important to get the perspective from a variety of levels of education. Bill Colhane from the Big Bid Theory Studios here in Austin, Texas, powered by Bid Prime. Rick Jennings, Rick, as usual, is turning the dials for us. Rick will have will educate us on this episode's crazy bid later in the show. Educate. You see you, you see what I did there? Briefly, before we get started, and, and speaking of education, congratulations to our friend Dr. Rodney Rohde, our resident public health expert from down at Texas State. Dr. Rohde, who most recently was on an episode to kick off this season, season six of our show, we got word that Dr. R was named a finalist in the Pathologist Power List 2020. Dr. Rohde has been a sought-after authority by media outlets around the globe discussing pandemic-related health topics. As a matter of fact, most recently, he was on a show from up in Canada. If you aren't following Dr. Rohde, you need to rectify that situation. Rick, I I see you over there nodding your head. (laughs) Yeah, uh, thanks, Bill. Well, I remember whenever Dr. Rohde first visited the show, um, what was it, five years ago or something like that? Well, being a Texas State grad myself, of course I'm a little biased, but it makes me really proud that uh, Dr. Rohde is doing such important work and being recognized for what he's doing. And you just said it, he was uh, he was on our show back in March when the conversation around COVID-19 really started up in this country, and since then in print, uh, radio, television, Dr. Rohde has been all over. And it's appropriate we discuss education today, so important, of course to our young people, our communities, the future. And we wanted to hear from people working to ensure a safe, productive school year, interesting, inspirational stories from a few of the stars in education. Again, be sure to tune in for Rick's Crazy Bid a little bit later. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, I've got a real interesting one this week. So if you are into VR or AR or anything in that tech field, uh, this one is going to be one for you. So stay tuned. And after this message, I'm going to tell you more about our guest. Coming up after this break, David Childress and Ken Bowens from the Louisa County Public Schools in Virginia will come by a little bit later. We'll head west of here out to Texas Tech University in Lubbock, and Dr. Delia Carazales will come by. Here's that brief message. The Big Bid Theory is brought to you in part by Bid Prime. Over 11 years in changing the bid services industry, Bid Prime has become the solution for businesses serious about winning public sector business. From the premier technology in the industry to real-time bid notifications, supporting documents, and robust data tools, it's all backed by unmatched, personalized customer support. Bid Prime. Start your free, zero-obligation trial today. BidPrime.com. Round one of our interviews discussing some of the latest in distance, or a lot of folks are referring to it as remote learning. We're going to have kind of a a tag team scenario in our first conversation. David Childress is the director of technology for Louisa County Public Schools. And by the way, where is Louisa County? I'm from Maryland, but I had to look it up. Louisa County is located about midway between Charlottesville and Richmond. So you geography nerds listening out there, you can kind of get an idea. Ken Bowens is also on the line. Ken is the director of CTE STEAM and Innovation. That's, and I had to look this up, that's Career and Technical Education slash Science, Technology, Engineering, the Arts and Mathematics and innovation for the schools in Louisa County. So David and Ken, glad to bring you on. We fully appreciate these are busy times as the three of us talked about off air, so to speak. And we thank you guys for taking part in this important conversation. Glad to be here. This is, this is David. Yeah, we're glad to be here and, and providing the information we can. 
No doubt about it. A lot, a lot of exciting things going on in Louisa County, not just the fact that, that schools recently opened. Our longtime listeners recall, know that in previous episodes, we've had Nat Duquan from Robot Lab, also Dr. Justin Bathin from the University of Kentucky came on the show talking about technology and education. Uh, I always joke with people that I remember back in the day how cool and cutting edge it was to have these things called calculators. Well, technology and education has changed, and I know you guys are there, boots on the ground, involved in it in a day-to-day basis. So if you guys could just kind of go through your experiences on how technology and education has evolved during your respective careers. Yeah, uh, this is David. And so I've been in education since 2004. And I can tell you, I mean, it's changed dramatically. You know, back in the early days, um, we would have individual labs, uh, PCs or Macs, if you uh, were lucky to, to have a Mac lab. But, you know, the students would go to that as if they were going to a normal class. And in the early days, they were actually, there was really no wireless uh, anywhere. So that was really one of the first changes that we started to see was the implementation of wireless technologies uh, into the schools. Uh, and then we had wireless on wireless carts. We called them cows, where they would push a cart of, of laptops around that had an access point and the teacher would plug it into a wall in the classroom. So you can imagine from that to now every student having a device. So Louisa is a one-to-one school division where pre-K through first grade students um, have iPads and second grade through 12th grade students all have uh, Chromebooks. David, when you say all students, do do you mean literally every student in Louisa County Public Schools has a device? Literally every student from pre-K. So our early, you know, three and four-year-old students, they actually have an iPad. Our kindergarten and first grade students have iPads and our second through 12th grade students all have Chromebooks. That's outstanding, of course, and I know I know you guys are aware, and we've got listeners from across the country, even in Canada, listening to the show. There are many school districts, and I know here in the state of Texas, heck, I know here in the Austin area, there are a number of schools where that is not the case. How did you guys pull that off? Well, it's been um, it, it's it's grown over the years, as, as you can imagine. Um, sure. As we slowly built funding into our technology plan through our CIP process, capital imp- improvement process, um, and you know, it, basically it boils down to we saw the importance of the technology and how it can have a profound impact uh, on students. And in fact, one of the first technology plans that I wrote addressed that. That you know, our, our students today are so immersed in technology and to not have it in a classroom is a disservice to our students because they, they think different now today than they did when you and I were in school. And so to have that technology and a place in which the students can feel comfortable to where they can collaborate uh, at, on their own level, on, at their own pace, uh, to me was imperative. And I think Louisa has done an outstanding job, you know, getting the technology out and uh, educating our students yeah. on the proper use and how to use the technology. That's outstanding. So this is uh, Kenny. I just want to talk for a minute instructionally. Um, you know, as a, I'm in the early stages of my career, both from in the classroom and as a student, when, when technology first started, I remember the only thing we used technology for, and I was there as a student during the times where we went to the computer lab. And then when they started rolling the carts in with the printer and uh, printers were the most cutting edge technology you could think of, um, you know, yeah. we used them for word processing and, and that was it. And, you know, it was come up with your uh, English paper, write it out by hand, and then you can type it on this amazing machine and, and it will print it out. Um, and to think about where we are now with uh, going on and using things like uh, the Google Suite to collaborate and create things, um, researching, you know, not using the old, I think it was like the WebQuest portal where half of us didn't know what we were doing. Um, to be able to go on Google and find something in a matter of seconds, uh, take ideas from all over the world and, and synthesize them together into a thought that's your own uh, and create something, whether it's a paper, an original music piece, a video, um, just the amount of things that you can do with technology. I, I, it was funny, I, a, a parent posted on a form the other day and said, how are my kids supposed to learn on these iPads? That this was in a, a, a community I live in, not Louisa. And I commented, said, actually, I know you, you use iPads 
your iPad just to watch Netflix, but it's an extremely powerful device that can do so many things. Um, you know, so once we really show parents and students the power of these devices and the, the things that they can create and synthesize from them, uh, it's really amazing what we can do. And both as a teacher and from when I was a student, it just, it still blows me away with, um, you know, the amount of technology that our students have access to um, and the amazing things they do with it. Sounds like you folks, again, there in Louisa County, it sounds like you folks are certainly ahead of many in terms of understanding and being able to to budget for and distribute the technology. Now, talking about what's going on today, uh, first of all, I know that you folks there in Louisa County, you're familiar with dealing with a crisis, an atypical situation, and you understand there in Louisa County about handling adversity and some folks listening to our conversation may hear Louisa County and ask themselves, why does that ring a bell? Well, if you recall the 2011 earthquake in Virginia, the epicenter of the 5.8 magnitude earthquake was Louisa County. Unfortunately, the high school was condemned many millions, millions of dollars of damage to the school. And I'm going to ask you guys this, and I understand it was nine years ago, but how, if at all, do you think that experience of being challenged, having to improvise, having to be creative, how has that helped your current leadership, community, and schools in dealing with the current COVID situation? So this is uh, Kenny here. Uh, neither David nor I were in Louisa County when the earthquake happened. We were working in other school divisions in the area. But what I can tell you is that I feel the impact that it had, especially every day during this situation, because a lot a lot of the members of our team were there. Um, in fact, our superintendent was there and, and many of the members of our leadership team were there. So when this first uh, happened, this pandemic, it, it was almost for them they clicked into survival mode, which was what they did during the earthquake. And we, we mobilized quicker than I would say probably any school division around us um, and started developing a plan. We locked ourselves in a room um, as much as we could every day for 10, 12, sometimes longer hours a day. We were on the phone on weekends. Um, you know, at one point we were working virtually when uh, the data was telling us we shouldn't be together, but we, we never stopped. And sometimes yeah. that was hard, but we had that leadership team that knew that that was the grit. We we talk about grit a lot in Louisa County, and it takes grit to get through something like the earthquake, and it takes grit to get through, through something like this. And, you know, during it, was it hard to do it? It's still hard every day. But to be honest with you, when, when I look around at some other school divisions and across, even across the nation who are about to open their doors and are struggling, and we sit around in a room, um, we just finished day three, and we all say to ourselves, you know, things are going well, things, this, all the systems we put in place are working. All the scenarios that we thought about are working the 300 plus hours we spent in command team planning meetings, you know, we're seeing it now and it's working. It, it, it's amazing feeling. Um, you know, I, I was telling some friends on Friday that, um, and I'm a fairly tough guy. I like to consider, I almost cried. Um, when, when the first couple of kids walked back through that door because the emotional experience of the amount of work that went into that um, and, and just how hard we all work together and how we rallied as a team. I, I almost wish that like Disney channel could come make a movie about it because it's just been a magical experience. Um, and you got to look for the positives in some of this, otherwise you won't make it through. Yeah. I was just going to say that, you know, we actually started planning early, um, you know, prior to, you know, a lot of these other school divisions uh, shutting down. I know as far as my technology department, we started planning in mid-February for what would we do, you know, if we ended up closing schools. You know, we, we, you know we're paying attention to the news, and we saw everything was happening in, in China, and uh, you know, saw the numbers continue to start to grow here in the United States. So we started almost immediately enacting a plan and starting you know, to put things together. How we're going to communicate out to students? How you know what is this going to look like if we end up uh, closing schools? So yeah, you know, I think that's helped us to to you know get ahead of the curve and. Throughout the entire process, our command team has continued to 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 do that, and so that's one of the reasons why I think you know, we were able to open uh, last Thursday, and it's been a huge success. You know, you walk through our schools, and the students are social distancing; they're wearing their masks. The, the schools are quiet, and then you look into a classroom, and the students are learning. And uh, so it's it's been awesome to see that. Um, when you talk about diversity, um, you, you know, one of the things like for me personally, uh, so my family was affected by a tornado that uh, hit in Amherst County in uh, 2018. And so, you know, we lost we lost everything that we had, our house and, and everything. And and what that shows you is that, you know, when you are faced with difficult situations, you it's the fight or flight. You know, you, you either 
you know, just dig deep and, you know, push hard and, and push through it or you give up. And I think, you know, as Kenny said, we talk about grit and Louisa and every director, every supervisor that I've spoken to here absolutely has grit. And not one person has ever thought about or mentioned, you know, giving up quitting throughout this whole process. And, you know, they've always been very strong, very complimentary of each other and supportive uh, throughout the entire process. And I think that's one thing that keeps us strong and, uh, you know, pushing forward. We have a new expression this year called crossing the line, uh, you know, making that difference. And uh, that every everybody here definitely does that. I've heard you guys use the word grit a number of times here at the start of our conversation. In times like these, imagination and innovation are also necessary, are needed. Please describe the Wireless on Wheels initiative. How did it come to be? What was involved? I know each of you gentlemen have put a lot of work into that program. Yeah, so this is uh, Kenny. Uh, so Wireless on Wheels came out of in the very beginning. Uh, I believe the shutdown was in March, and and we were sitting around the room um, around that time. Like David and I have mentioned several meetings, and we were talking about all the things that we had to accomplish and all the ways we had to help the community get through this. And we knew that virtual learning was going to have to happen at some point, whether it was a blended model, it was a full virtual. You know, even then, we we knew looking ahead that that we were going to need some type of solution. And our community does not have um, internet access to every household, as many communities don't. And we, we were trying to think of ways that we could we could kind of help ease this burden. So the first thing we did was, um, and David and his team sprung into action, setting up um, open networks at the schools so that people could come into the parking lots and, and uh, connect. But unfortunately, some of our schools, uh, we have a very large county. So for some people to get to our schools, it could take upwards of 40 minutes. So we started kicking around the idea of, you know, how do we create mobile hotspot units that, uh, you know, we can deploy throughout the community. And it, we talked about putting them on buses. But then, you know, as we were talking about those things, it was, you know, will buses have to run or maybe we could plug them in. And there were just a lot of conversations. And uh, David and I kind of sidebarred on this and, and we'll probably go to our grave saying whose idea it was first. Um, but <laughs> really, the, the truth of it is it was a true collaboration between him and I. And when people ask me, like, whose idea was this? And who's, I don't really remember because it was such a fluid process of him and I just sitting there bouncing. Well, what if we did this? What if we did this? And I know at one point the trailer idea came up and. I think I had said, well, we can run an extension cord from businesses that are willing to, to allow us to. And David said, well, what about solar? And then we were like, hmm, what would that look like? And and what we came up with was basically a, a small trailer. I believe it's four by six, uh, just a basic trailer you can get at Lowe's. Um, and we used all basically um, framing lumber material that you could get at any Lowe's or hardware store. And we, we built a box and a frame. Uh, we mounted solar panels on it and installed batteries and then connected it in with a, um, a mobile hotspot on an antenna that gets you about a 300 foot radius around the, the trailer. Um, and we built our first one right before we went on spring break. And I remember it was basically just David and I and a few other people who kind of walked up and like, what are you doing? And jumped in to help us build for a little bit. And, um, you know, we deployed that first one at the food line and, and people were just amazed at, at the technology and um, how it was working. And, and ba essentially, you know, you can pull up to this and you can log on to school Wi-Fi and, um, you know, we've, we've said estimated, you know, between five to 10 people at once. And, um, every time we go to the food line parking lot, there'd be people there. And we were kind of like, you know, we think we have something here. This is, this is really working well. And the support of our school board and our superintendent, uh, without even hesitation said, let, let's go, like, let's ramp it up. Let's build more. Um, so we sprung into action as soon as we got back from our uh, spring break and we pretty much revved up an assembly line. And, you know, the first day or two was maybe slow as we were teaching everyone how to build them. And um, I would say by the third day, we were pumping out four to five a day. Um, and there are currently 23 units uh, ready and out deployed. And we are in the process of starting 10 more this week. Um, so it's been a pretty phenomenal project. A lot of school divisions around the, the uh, area have come and seen it been featured on a lot of news stations and um, it's gotten a lot of um, press, but none of that really matters. What's great is I was, at, I actually drive by two on my way home and both of them today, there were cars that when I went to subway at lunch, there were four cars at the one in the food line parking lot. That's what gets me excited is to drive by and see these people using them. That's what we built them for. And um, it's, it's been great because people don't have to go as far to get to it. So the, the easier we can make it for them to get to those uh, wow units as we call them wireless on wheels and access the content, download and get the instruction that they need. Um, at the end of the day, that was the main goal. And, 
And the beauty of it is that we're not asking anything from the, the, the site. So wherever we put these, you know, we work out with the person who owns the site, but they, the, all we need is a parking spot. Um, we don't have to plug in. They don't, there's no real um, burden on them. Um, so it's, it's been a really, like I said, amazing project. And uh, I'll let David jump in because um, he, like, again, he and I are, I couldn't have done it without him. So um, I'll let him jump in and fill any gaps. So I, I think you did a great job there explaining that Kenny. And uh, I mean, it's, so I, I went out uh, down uh, town Louisa today to get some lunch. And uh, there happened to be, I think I counted five cars at that time. And actually uh, it was a couple of them were like explorers. And they had the, the trunk open uh, and you could see the kids sitting in the back with the Chromebooks in their laps as they were you know, sitting there doing their work. So it's, it's very exciting to see you know, these units being used. Uh, you know, you spend a lot of time thinking about these ideas and creating them and, and putting it into production. But when you see it in use and know that you're having a profound impact in somebody's education, it's, it's really a very fulfilling uh, feeling uh, to see that. It's got to be no doubt about it. And to take our listeners behind the curtain just for a second, I think our longtime listeners understand how we go about identifying guests to come on the show. Well, in preparation for this particular episode, one of our researchers went out and they were looking for experts on remote learning, distance learning, and came, they came across the information about wireless on wheels um, through EdWeek, I, I believe is where Lauren found it. So, so it is such an interesting project. And to our listeners, David and Kenny were kind enough to share a link to some background information on wireless on wheels. So if you go to the description of this episode, we will have a link to that information. There are some there's some tremendous background information, obviously, but also you can actually see some pictures of the um, the units themselves. The, the trailers units themselves and uh, and see them in action. So tremendous. David, you guys are, are very aware because you live there. Louisa County is a rural area. 97% of the United States is considered rural. Connectivity needs are enormous. You just talked about the WOW units and they're so necessary today. And I'm I'm saying pandemic or not, there's a lot of investment in broadband, in my opinion, not enough. Um, there's also money, of course, targeted by the public sector for other tech-related tools as well. You folks there in Virginia, along with connectivity, what are the tech challenges faced by your educators, your students, parents, that would maybe be particular to a rural area in your community? Certainly. I mean, that's, uh, you know, probably one of the biggest issues that we face, you know, is, is the connection issue because we, we mm -hmm. are so rural. You know, how do you get uh, Internet to these localities? And Louisa County has, has worked on it. We uh, the county's installed. Uh, they, we built four towers uh, over this past uh, year. In fact, that was one of the first projects that I got to work on uh, when I came to Louisa County Schools. Was, uh, I did the I was in charge of the fiber backbone uh, to connect some elementary schools and those towers together. So I, I say that's one of the biggest things, you know, we talk about uh, EBS, Educational Broadband Spectrum, uh, that's been out uh, for a long time. You know, it, it would be great if the FCC could you know, do something better with that to make that more uh, easily accessible for uh, localities to be able to stand up our own uh, networks. Because while we own these towers, I can't actually put up any type of connectivity to serve the families uh, with wireless Internet. And so, you know, that's certainly a challenge. And I know we have other school districts in Virginia. I think Fredericksburg is trying to do something with that now. And they're being blocked by some of the, the cellular carriers as they're trying to uh, procure some of the uh, EBS spectrum. I'm here in Texas. So you can go to parts of Texas, of course, where, where you are off the grid. I travel across the United States of America, mostly in the South, mostly in the Southwest, whether it be air travel or ground travel. And it's still amazing to me that in 2020, there are still issues with connectivity. And and hopefully, and I know you guys keep better tabs on it than I do, hopefully here in the not too distant future, we'll get a, a better grasp on it because not everybody out there are doing things like wireless on wheels. And with so many schools going to hybrid models, strictly online models, um, I'm really concerned to see what impact that is going to have on education and the futures of these young people who don't have access to, 
It sounds like Louisa County Public Schools, you guys have a tremendous handle on things, but uh, you, you guys know there are places out there right now that I imagine are getting ready to struggle. Oh, for, yeah, this is David speaking, I, and I can I can agree with that. Um, you know, as I mean, just to give you an example. So um, e- even as the director, I do sit in on uh, the help desk and take calls uh, to help our families. Um, you know, we had planned to have one person running a virtual help desk to help with that. Uh, but the call load has been such that four of us have I had to take calls throughout the day to support our families. And when you talk about challenges, you know, one of the bigger challenges is the fact that some of our parents, uh, whether it be elderly uh, grandparents who are now raising, you know, the grandkids or, or even uh, some of the younger parents don't really understand the technology and how to do, you know, even some of the simpler things that are asked of them. And uh, as just as a simple example, um, we had a family call the help desk. They were, the student was supposed to be doing something with a Google slide presentation and inserting pictures, and they didn't understand how to get pictures off of their phone and into this Google slideshow. So having to teach the parents and teach the students how to how to do that over the phone, I'm sure you can see the challenges and yeah. uh, trying to make something like that happen. Here in the, here in Central Texas, we I think for the most part have the connectivity issue handled. But if you don't have a device, if you don't have a computer, if you don't have an iPad, if you don't have a Chromebook, if you don't have a phone, Wi-Fi doesn't mean a whole lot to you. Yeah, this is Kenny here. I wanted to, to kind of elaborate on a point that David made is that one part of our plan, I know we didn't talk a lot about our school reopening plan, but we're offering a hybrid uh, in-person two day a week virtual, the other opposite days of the week, and then also a full virtual school. So a lot of these um, help desk calls that Mr. Children's and his team are, are fielding are from people who selected the full virtual model. So we really believed in choice here that, you know, we know that full virtual learning is not for everyone. Um, but for those people that have health concerns or, or, or family issues or things that, that they don't feel safe sending their children to school, um, you know, they're opting into this virtual model by choice and they still have these challenges of, you know, people will select the full virtual model and then say, okay, well, I don't have internet now. What am I supposed to do? Um, and, and because that is the right model for them for whatever their situation is. And, and instead of just saying, you know, too bad, you know, we're, we roll up our sleeves and we help them figure it out because we believe that in the value of the education for every single one of our students and children. Well, guys, I could have, because education, like for many people, education is so near and dear to my heart. I could have this conversation with you guys for hours on end, but I do know that you're trying to get Louisa Louisa County Public Schools up and running, and it sounds like you've done a tremendous job in getting everybody ready, but I do appreciate the time you guys visiting with us. Best of luck to everyone in Louisa County. Hope you guys have a safe, successful school year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ken and David out at Louisa County Public Schools in Virginia. Kind of an extended interview, but a lot of important, interesting information contained in our conversation. But now, due to the magic of the podcast, we can travel a couple of thousand miles west of Virginia out to Lubbock, Texas, where I had an opportunity to visit with Dr. Delia Carrizales from Texas Tech University College of Education. Dr. Carrizales is an assistant professor at Texas Tech in the teacher education department. She started her career in education 14 years ago as a kindergarten teacher. Since then, she's worked in various school districts in Texas here in the Lone Star State. Dr. Carrizales specializes in investigating and creating transformative methods to make content comprehensible for students. She completed her undergrad at Our Lady of the Lake University down in San Antonio. Go Saints, and earn her master's and PhD at Texas Tech University. Dr. Carrizales, thank you for joining the show. Thank you for having me here today. At Texas Tech, as one example, Dr. Carrizales, in the fall, the plan is to utilize a blend of face-to-face, a combination of face-to-face instruction and online learning, and strictly online modalities. In your career, you've been involved in the development and execution of online courses. I glanced at your bio. From an educator's perspective, what are some of the key considerations in developing, meaning putting together and ensuring online courses are successful? So the key points I'm going to discuss are based on my opinions, my experiences, and student feedback I've received over the past seven years. And they're not going to be in a particular order, but number one, 
online learning needs to be organized and predictable. For example, students need to have a consistent schedule. For elementary and high school students, it will vary. For example, at the college level, we provide a syllabus for the entire semester. But for elementary and high school, I would recommend a weekly calendar with topics that will be covered. Also, content in the learning management system, there's Google Classroom, uh, Schoology, there, depending on what the school district is using, should be easily accessible, meaning that students should know where they're going to uh, access lessons. They need to know where or how they're going to write questions and communicate with their instructor and how they will turn in assignments. And then number two, online learning should offer various assignments and methods to make content comprehensible. And what I mean by this, teachers at all levels should provide some type of group activities and individual projects for students. Alongside with synchronous and asynchronous learning, of course, if it's synchronous learning, they need to schedule it ahead of time so that students know when they will be meeting uh, for synchronous learning. And number three, and I, and and this is just something you know again that I've learned. It's very important to build relationships with students, and a way to build those relationships with students to make online instruction work is through Zoom meetings. I think if students get to know the professor, uh, it it helps them understand the content and even at, at a personal level. For example, some of my students, they're uh, in student teaching from eight to three and then they come home and they need to work on assignments and they have questions at 9.30 and I'll let them know, I can't meet with you via Zoom until 9.30 until my toddler's, toddler's asleep, then we can meet. Of course, and not just here in the state of Texas, but across the country, the parents and students experience the online learning. You visit with a number of educators. You work there in the School of Education at Texas Tech. Were there some specific lessons learned that you've heard from teachers or school administrators looking back at the spring of 2020? Was there some common feedback that that you've been hearing? The most common feedback or one of the lessons that teachers learned was to make sure to record lessons. So our students come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, and we need to keep in mind that not everyone can join at the same time. If you have a family of three Mm. uh, children, not everyone has a technology device. And it's important to record lessons. That way, the student can access the lesson later on. And that's something that's a, that just depends on, on the student. That's a, a very good point. My son is a middle school teacher here in the Austin area. And there are a number of his students who simply don't have access to the technology. Or as you pointed out, maybe there is technology in the home, but not enough devices to, to accommodate everybody. I mentioned earlier how Texas Tech, similar to many universities across the country, is planning on a blended approach. You've been in education in the classroom, now at Texas Tech's teacher education department. What are some of the primary challenges you and your team there in Lubbock have prepared for and anticipate for those in higher education specifically? When you look at the universities and colleges, not just here in the state of Texas, but across the country, So there are various challenges, but I'd like to focus particularly in course development and teacher education. Prior to COVID, teacher preparation courses included one technology course. Moving forward, in addition to a technology course, I personally believe professors need to design courses on how to teach online for K-12 through educators in different content areas. At Texas Tech University, we have uh, a May graduation and an August graduation for pre-service teachers in the College of Education. So one of the major challenges for higher education professors will be to find time to develop new method courses between now and January. One of my colleagues and I are working on a method course for teacher preparation, and we are including perhaps one or two modules. That's about two months worth of content on how to teach online to K through 12 students. And what we would like to do is prepare our pre-service teachers on different methods to teach online. While when they start in the classroom, we don't know when the pandemic will end. We don't know what the future holds. And because of this, we feel it's vital that we start preparing teachers for online instruction. 
I applaud. I mentioned during my visit with David and Ken from Louisa County Public Schools, how right now there, it requires so much imagination and thinking outside the box, so to speak. So it's interesting to hear you describe what's taking place there at Texas Tech. Final thing, Dr. Carazales, there are so many wonderful, amazing dedicated teachers out there. You've taught and mentored many teachers in your career. What would be your message to teachers as they continue onward, as they prepare for the 2021 school year? To any teacher listening out there, don't be too hard on yourself. You're doing a phenomenal job. Thank you for everything you do for our students. And I appreciate you and the notice sacrifices you're making for our students. Very good, Dr. Carazales. I could not agree with you anymore. Well, Dr. Carazales, we, we again, we appreciate your time. All the best to you and our friends out in Lubbock at Texas Tech University. Thank you for having me here today. We hope you found those conversations interesting and informative to our listeners. Best of luck to you, your students, your communities, your schools in this school year. Again, thank you to David and Ken from over in Virginia with Louisa County Public Schools and Dr. Carazales from Texas Tech. Well, it's time for a quick crazy bid. Rick, what do you have in this installment? Thanks, Bill. So um, for this installment of Crazy Bids, I found a really interesting one that uh, kind of caught my eye. Um, this one is being issued by the Department of the Air Force, and they are looking to procure a virtual welding simulator. Um, so there's a lot of... I guess like virtual reality and augmented reality uh, solicitations going on, and they're mostly used for training purposes because if you really think about it, um, it's so much easier to train, say, like a truck driver or somebody getting their CDL license in virtual reality rather than putting them in a huge 18-wheeler or something like that. So um, there's a lot going on in virtual reality and augmented reality right now, and this one for the virtual welding simulator, it really costs caught my eye because I don't know if you know this, but I um, actually back when I was in high school, I um, had a little side job as working as a welder's assistant. He was a family friend of ours, and I think he taught me a little bit about a practice called MIG welding, if I remember correctly. Um, so this one kind of caught my eye, and uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of different um, in the specifications and such. They're talking about many many different types of welding, and it seems it seems a really neat way to to um, really teach somebody without having all the dangers present of, uh, you know, welding and everything. But here's another interesting point. Um, so I, in my, I guess in my off time, I like to uh, play video games online with my friends and such. And I don't really do any of the new like virtual reality stuff because that, uh, that equipment's real expensive, but it's real neat tech. And there are some games that are coming through that are just simulators, like um, like Microsoft has always done their flight simulator. Um, you'll also start to see like farming simulators and games, and uh, like I've seen so much as city bus driver simulator and such. So I'm very excited to see the version of this that hits retail for welding simulator, and I'm going to invite all my friends in and use my uh, knowledge of welding to go ahead and get. Um, get a little bit of a leg up on them. So if you are a company that can uh, work in virtual training uh, simulations and such, then the virtual welding simulator bid from the Department of the Air Force is this week's crazy bid that you can win. Rick, you are a man of many talents. I didn't know that welding was a part of your repertoire. But anyway, thanks again for that crazy bids. That does it. Thanks for sharing, downloading, and following our show, The Big Bid Theory. Continue sending over those emails. We appreciate hearing from you folks. My email is bcolhane at bidprime.com. You can also give us a follow over on the Twitterverse at The Big Bid Theory. My Twitter handle is contract underscore hunter. And don't forget, check out our Facebook page as well. And please smash that like button if you get a second to do so. Powered by Bid Prime for Rick, Rick Jennings, and Kevin Henderson, and our entire team. Thanks again to David Childress, Ken Bowens, and Dr. Carazales. 
We hope that everyone has the safest possible and most productive school year. This is Bill Colhane. Until next time, go Gunners, Barracudas, Tigers, Bobcats, and Cubs, and we wish you all the best in growing your business. Powered by Bid Prime, we thank you for tuning in to The Big Bid Theory. From Austin, Texas, the show is produced by Bill Colhane and Jim Ward. Producer and engineer is Rick Jennings. Distribution, research, and production assistance by Kevin Henderson. You can find other episodes of the show on platforms such as iHeart, iTunes, Spreaker, Google Play, Stitcher, among others. As always, thank you for downloading and sharing the podcast. We're having so much fun, so much fun.